Hey all here OS Reviews, you're watching our throwback review of the Fujitsu Aeros X, also known as the F-02E. This is a phone that came out in late 2013, and the reason why we're taking a look at it now is because, first of all, it was a device that was pretty ahead of its time. For a phone that is now 5 years old, it packed a full 1080p display, impressive for the time, also had a fingerprint scanner, which was very fresh as well, in addition to a 16 megapixel camera and a NVIDIA Tegra 3 processor, which is quad-core clocked at 1.7 gigahertz. The phone, like many other Japanese devices, is also fully waterproof. So one reason why you may want to consider this device is because of the price. It's of course fallen down uh, dramatically. You can now find it on Amazon for as low as $40 give and take. So as a secondary backup phone and unlocked device, it might not be such a poor choice with uh, specs that are still decent as a mid-tier phone in 2018. Secondly, it's also going to be a very interesting point of comparison because I always like to look at imported phones and devices which are uh, uh, more rare and unusual for the US, and this is another great example of that. Starting with the design, the Aeros X actually has a pretty conventional look, at least from the back. It's made out of a soft touch rubber material, so it's easy to grip. And here is the fingerprint scanner that also serves as an on-off key. Uh, very interesting. Here's the 16.3 megapixel camera capable of capturing HD video and an LED flash, which is also produced by Sony. There's a chrome accent and a slightly uh, angular shape to the edges, which are made out of a polycarbonate frame. And very interestingly, for a waterproof phone as well as a dustproof phone, the back cover is actually uh, uh, removable. It has a seal that uh, prevents any water from leaking in, and here we can see the battery uh, right on top. It's 2,450 milliamp hours, uh, which is definitely on the smaller side for a phone that used a pretty power-intensive Tegra 3 chipset and a 1080p display. It's definitely one of the weakest aspects of this particular phone. You'll probably have to recharge it once or maybe even uh, two times each day, so not great. On the top, though, we do have access to a 3.5mm headphone jack, along with a flap covering up the micro USB charging port. Interestingly, the phone also has contact points on the bottom, so you can actually pick up an, an optional dock, so a handy little display accessory that can also turn the phone into an alarm clock. It charges also using micro USB, and when you press down on all the sides, that's where a contacts will uh, protrude from the edges, and then touch the two metal contacts on the back. The phone also has a rear-facing speaker, so sound is another area where it's not outstanding, but it's passable. Microphone is on the bottom, and on the front we have no keys at all. These are using fully on-screen buttons, which was also pretty ahead of its time. On the side, there's access to a dedicated volume rocker and another power on-off switch. There's a earpiece on the top, a front-facing camera, which is rated at roughly 5 megapixels, and a proximity light sensor. So turning the device on, uh, first of all, again, we have a pretty... Uh, pixel dense 1080p display on a 5 inch size. I still kind of miss 5 inch phones in general just because now we have larger and larger devices, which offers a pretty seamless uh, experience for interacting with media, but it's a little harder to hold using one hand. This phone is a lot more comfortable to hold. I think 5 inches is more of a perfect size for many people. Now, one of the more interesting things about this phone, again, is that fingerprint scanner. Like the Samsung Galaxy S5, it's actually a uh, sensor where you have to physically slide to unlock instead of just tapping one. So it's not quite as convenient as on a modern phone. Uh, you can also think of it uh, very similar to the Motorola Atrix 4G, if you guys remember that device. But it's actually pretty functional. You can add up to 10 fingerprints, and you can simply swipe once to unlock it. From here, we are greeted into the UI, which is actually pretty heavily customized, like most uh, Japanese phones uh, under Docomo's service that we've checked out in the past. So we have a pretty thick uh, skin on top of the Android Jelly Bean 4.1 experience, including some interesting widgets like this sheep that uh, says hi and walks around, as well as some more carrier-specific bloatware, including uh, games, as well as uh, business cards, social media feeds, things like that. Luckily, you can uninstall many of these services if you don't want to use them, but it's uh, far from being a stock experience of Android right out of the box. From here, we can also see the on-screen controls. These keys also offer haptic feedback, so whenever you tap on them, the entire phone vibrates. Uh, that gives the sensation as if you're tapping on a real button. So let's start with the camera. So 16 megapixel sensor, again, is uh, still a very high megapixel count. In fact, many flagships today only come with 13 megapixels or so. Um, and uh, Japanese phones have always delivered when it comes to having uh, pretty cutting-edge specs, especially for 
or five years ago, their counterparts to carrier-specific phones that we got in the US always seems to be a little bit more advanced. Uh, with that being said, the interface here is pretty basic. You can tap on menu to take a closer look at things like switching to the HDR mode, as well as setting uh, the resolution. I can also begin recording video, taking panoramas, as well as uh, taking a closer look at QR codes and barcode scanning directly from this camera app, which is actually pretty cool. Now, one downside is for whatever reason, whether it's the Tegra 3 chipset not being as optimized as maybe a Qualcomm, um, or maybe it's just the phone getting a little bit older now, I don't find this to be the snappiest performer when it comes to some of these basic utility uh, programs, like the camera app. Especially if you're using the HDR mode, you kind of have to hold still for quite a few seconds before you can let go and the shot is finished in terms of processing. So definitely not the fastest camera by any means. But I can swipe to the right to take a closer look at some images I've captured, and zooming in, there is plenty of details even under darker environments because, again, of the 16 megapixel sensor. Um, it's definitely not going to be as good as flagship level phones today like the Galaxy S9 or the iPhone 10 or the Pixel 2, but uh, you get the idea that for a phone of its uh, age, it actually is respectable and uh, holds itself well against other mid-tier and budget-oriented phones uh, coming out today. So the overall audio quality seems to be quite average uh, since the speaker is on the back. It can get muffled up occasionally. With that being said, it does pack quite a punch in terms of volume. It doesn't have a great depth or immersiveness, but it's more than sufficient for playing back the occasional songs on YouTube or for streaming back videos. It does also have Dolby Mobile uh, built on it. It's a software enhancement for the sound that allows you to also change some of the equalizer profiles. Uh, so there are a few tricks up the uh, phone sleeves that enhances the audio ever so slightly. Speaking of, this is also a good opportunity to take a quick look at the web browsing experience. We are using Chrome, and let's try loading up the New York Times. So the page is currently rendering, and we are connected using Wi-Fi. You can see we have about four bars of reception. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer for sure than on a modern-day flagship or even on a premium mid-end device, but slowly but surely it is fully uh, loading and we can see that scrolling seems to be quite smooth and responsive. New York Times is of course a pretty complex page with many ads, uh, videos, scrolling elements, and smaller text that is very difficult for less powerful hardware to run. It's comparable to something like the original HTC One M7, which we also did a throwback review on just a few days ago. And in my opinion, that phone got slightly faster performance in general navigation tasks. So in that regard, this is a little bit disappointing, but still, it's more than acceptable. Some of the more unique elements of the phone include access to TV. There's actually an integrated antenna on this phone, just like on many other Japanese phones and Chinese phones. Uh, you can pull out this antenna and it actually can bend uh, and you're able to receive channels through the air. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in North America, or at least in the States, just because we no longer receive uh, kind of analog signals. It's all been converted to digital. But uh, across certain countries, you're still able to receive some free channels and stations, uh, which is actually pretty cool uh, to take a look at. Otherwise, if we go into settings, there's also a lot of customization going on from Fujitsu. There's also access to a very interesting privacy view. It uh, basically adds a shield to the screen, and now if you're tilting it from an angle, basically if you have someone next to you on a subway or on a bus, they're unable to really see what you're looking at. But head-on, you're able to still see basically the content on here. It's a very interesting trick. I believe there are also software or apps that you can install in the Play Store to get a very similar experience, but on here it's built right on in. I can also change the opacity of the uh, effect from being high, so the contrast is now even more dramatic to you know, being invisible from the side, to a low as well if you want to toggle around with some of these settings, and I can of course also turn this off. Other interesting apps include a battery eco manager which allows you to save on the consumption. There's also access to an infrared sensor on here that allows you to share information with other compatible smartphones uh, using kind of beaming technology as opposed to Bluetooth. And the media player is also heavily customized uh, from the manufacturer and allows us to take a look at movies as well as music and access online content as well. 
and this is a file that is in full 1080p that shows up against some of its colors. Still is a pretty good panel even in 2018 uh, since, again, the PPI is very high as a 5-inch device. The bezels on the sides are also respectable, even though the ones on the top and the bottom are getting a little bit large today. Although the vast majority of games' titles can be still installed from the Play Store without any problems, there are a few things to keep in mind. First of all, Android Jelly Bean is kind of outdated in terms of security patches, so if you are looking for the most encrypted and safest phone, then this is definitely not one for you. The second would be if you're running some of games and titles, even though it will still load, it takes a long time for it to uh, fully render compared to the latest flagships. It's not that bad compared to other phones around the same age, again, like the HTC One M7, you'll get similar benchmark results. Uh, but just be patient and wait for a few seconds longer. There will be a few more dropped frames here and there, but everything is still for the most part manageable. Now, despite having a plastic body, the phone does still get uh, fairly warm around the back if you are doing a lot of intensive gaming, especially if, when you're using it for longer than an hour at once. Uh, but otherwise, the phone seems to be pretty consistent in terms of performance with it so far. So that's more or less it as far as our throwback retro look at the uh, Fujitsu Eros X, also known as the F-02E uh, smartphone for Japan. This is definitely not a mainstream device by any means, but it was still kind of interesting for us to take a look back at it just because uh, it was quite ahead of its time five years ago. So you can check out more details about this in the links down below, but for now this has been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. This has been the Fujitsu Eros X, also known as the F-02E Android smartphone.